Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, little bit of a break from me, apologies, but I'm back home now and I'm crook, so a bit of a chance to sit down and edit some videos. And please excuse my voice, I'm trying not to drown in my own snot. It was a couple of months ago now, but I did these three kneeboards for a surf club down south from here. I thought it would be interesting to do three different videos, one on each board, just because they would different dings on these boards and the condition of each board kind of required a um, different level of finish. So this blue board, quite a new board, pretty simple ding, but very close to the S of the Sonic logo, so had to keep it pretty small and contained. This grey dolphin uh, is literally a brand new board. From memory I think this was its first or second time in the water. You can see the ding is really severe, uh, it was definitely an impact, and it's really close to the logo again. So required quite a high level finish, both painting and structurally. And the board we're going to be working on today is this green Sonic. Uh, you can see the nose is in pretty terrible condition, and shortly you'll see that the tail is in pretty crappy condition as well. I was asked just to go over this whole board and fix anything major, and although there were a lot of little things that could need repairing, like this little solar res patch here, and there's another couple along the way, and the other side was covered in them, they just wanted the major stuff fixed, and that worked out to be the nose and the tail, which was good for me, because it kind of kept me away from any logo work on this one. They always seem to ding these boards right next to the logos. For the price of these boards new, they're definitely worth saving, and as an owner of one of these boards, I feel it's your responsibility to keep these things out of landfill because at the end of the day, they can be repaired and they are made of super gnarly materials. So we're going to focus on the tail of this board. You can see between each gouge down to the foam, there's actually a crease and you can see that glass moving. So it is delammed. So we're going to weaken the glass up with some 80 grit sandpaper as much as we can and really see what's going on under there. So 80 grit is pretty coarse to start a board off with, but because we want to thin the glass out to make cutting easier, we want to remove the paint so we can actually see what's going on and ultimately there's no structural integrity to this fiberglass at all. 80 grit's just going to get our sanding done quicker. Now we've got a little bit more of an idea of what we're looking at without that paint. So again, very soft, very rubbish glass, especially now that I've sanded it with 80 grit. If it didn't have to come off, it certainly does now. So we're just trying to work out where to start our cut, basically, and how much we're really going to have to remove. Probably not all the way to the tail, but pretty close to it. So starting in the centre of the crease, because that's going to be my softest bit of glass, I'm going to make a little incision, cut down into the foam where I can, and then using the blade, I'm going to get it between the glass and the foam and just work my way back until I'm at an area where the glass is still laminated to the foam. And this is the nightmare that we're left with. So quite a lot of glass removed just checking around my edges to make sure that it's solid. If it's not solid and I can see the fiberglass moving, then I've got to cut back further until it stops moving. It can get a little bit confusing, but there is a small area here where the glass appears to be moving. I'll push it in a second. But it's actually the foam beneath the glass is broken, but the glass is laminated. So our new foam will hold that old foam in place once it's set. Please excuse me pointing at everything like an idiot in these clips. I was actually talking as I was filming. I filmed this quite a while ago before I had some kind of method to my madness. But we're masked off here. I've built a bit of a wall with some tape. We're going to fill this up with foam. This is kind of a prime example of why we repair things with foam and not with resin and micro balloon mixes or Q cell mixes. We will use Q cell in these repairs, but certainly not in the way you would see on other YouTube videos. Moving on to the nose of the board here, same process, but sanded with 120, cleaned up. We're going to repair it with foam. And just for those that are late to the party, we'll go over again the reasons why we repair boards with foam and not with resin, micro balloon mixes, or car bogs. 
First one would be cost. Foams, expanding or otherwise, are much cheaper than especially epoxy resins and micro balloons. Second reason is to do with densities. So things like resin mixed with Q-cell or carbogs are very hard, very dense. Foam, especially EPS, is very soft. So to put very hard materials and uneven materials up against very soft materials in an object like a board that flexes and twists and moves and takes impacts is a surefire way to cavitate the foam below your repair down the track and it will need further repair later on. With the price of expanding PU or even just offcuts of EPS or even PU foams, I just don't see any excuse for filling customers' boards with resin and Q-cell mixes. You're only going to cause them more dramas down the line. There are a lot of questions on my previous videos about whether or not this expanding PU foam can be used on EPS boards. So as you can see here, the answer to that is yes. This whole clip is sped up, but in total it took four minutes for this big batch to expand and harden. So it works so fast that it doesn't get a chance to negatively affect the EPS foam beneath it. I wouldn't take the raw materials and pour them on EPS foam, but once they're mixed and expanding, it does act really quickly. So in total on the tail here, I used a 60 mil of 56 kg foam. I went a little bit harder with this one just because the area was so big. And then on the nose here, I used 20 mil of a 36 kg foam, which is a little bit softer. It's about the same as EPS, whereas the 56 is about the same as a PU surfboard blank. So our favorite job, of course, we all know it's sanding. So just gonna sand it down to shape as close as can. Uh, can go a little bit lower if need, because there's probably gonna be some small air bubbles in it. And that means we're going to give it a skim with a resin and micro balloon mix next. Same deal with the tail. Obviously quite a lot of foam to be getting rid of. So I'm going a hard pad and some 80 grit to start off with. Once I get closer, I'll put the soft pad on and use 120 to kind of get it to shape. With a pour of this size, there will inevitably be some air bubbles. I did fill the larger air bubbles that I could see with more foam but there's always going to be some smaller ones. So that's where our next stage of filling in those air bubbles, giving it a skim with some resin and some micro balloons comes in. Keep in mind that our foam is sanded pretty much perfectly to shape. So the, the real goal behind doing this is to force as much resin and micro balloon mixture as you can into any little air bubbles. Always leave a little bit extra on top so you've got something to sand but the idea is just to fill those air bubbles and 99% of the resin you leave on top here is going to be sanded off. Same deal on the nose. It probably didn't really need it, this one, because it was quite a small pour of foam, but I had the extra, extra resin mix anyway, so may as well give it a quick skim while I'm there. Keep in mind that all of these EPS repairs are, of course, with epoxy. Epoxy has about a 24-hour curing time, I'll always do all of my epoxy resin pours at the end of the day before I go home. So each resin pour you see represents basically a day, which gives you an idea of how long these jobs can take. Back to our favorite job, which of course is sanding. A couple of goals here, of course we want to smooth off that resin mix, we want to make sure all those uh, air bubbles are filled in, we want everything shaped properly, but also we're essentially here preparing for laminating. So we want to make sure that we've sanded far enough up the board that our lamination or our cloth is going to adhere. Seeing as the surface is painted, we want to sand it pretty hard. But old paint like this, you shouldn't have an issue putting epoxy lamination over the top of it. So yeah, keep in mind, we're not only sanding the patch that we've been working on, but we're now sanding beyond that to where we want to be working on our next step. All sanded here, ready to lamb. Just a quick look, you can still see the foam through our thin, very thin layer of micro balloon mix. So we've added no weight to this board at all, or next to no weight at all, and the majority of our repair is made up of foam and not resin. 
On to laminating, uh, both nose and tail are going to be 6 ounce wraps. You can see that I've masked off at the end of my fiberglass cloth, so we're going to essentially do the same as a cut lap if we were laminating a brand new board. So we're going to let that resin basically cure or gel, and then we'll cut along the edge of the glass and the masking tape, and that'll leave us our edge. If this were a surfboard I was glassing, I would never do a straight edge of masking tape the way I have here. There's a couple of reasons I've done the straight edge of tape. Normally you would never do the straight edge because a straight line from rail to rail on a surfboard essentially creates a snapping point and the board can crease there. But with a board of this thickness and girth, the chances of snapping a board like this are slim to none. The other reason is because I have to think about the painting step, and so if I'd masked it off as a diamond or a triangle, I would have to laminate up further, I'd have to hot coat up further, and ultimately I'd have to paint up further on the board, and there's only so much painting I want to do on this job, so I'm keeping that area smaller. So the next day, and our lamination is cured, so we've got a couple of goals here with sanding. We want to bring down our lamination edges, any high edges, we want to make them flush with the original surface of the board. We also want to run our sandpaper over the rest of our lamination, not sanding it away, but we want to make sure it's scuffed up so our resin will stick. And we want to sand a little bit beyond where we want our next layer of resin to go. For a lack of better terminology, um, we're going to refer to this as the hot coating stage. So I've cleaned this up with just an air compressor and a towel. Uh, a lot of people will suggest that you clean up before your hot coat with acetone. I personally use Entropy CLR resin, and I find that this resin in particular, not others like Kinetics, but the Entropy seems to react really poorly if you clean the surface with acetone, and I end up with fish eyes and other blemishes if I do use acetone. So if you're using this same kind of resin and you're having problems with blemishes, try not cleaning with acetone. Same deal on the tail end, all masked off, all cleaned up, and doing the hot coat step. Obviously I'm only coating the top side, but both the top and the bottom side of the nose and the tail are going to need coating. So you can get away with, if you do this coat first thing in the morning, then before you go home at the end of the day, you can flip the board over and get that last layer on before you go home. Otherwise each side is basically a day per coat because of the drying time of epoxy. Once our hot coat is cured, we're gonna sand with 120, 240, 320 dry on the orbital, and then 320, 480, and 600 wet. And we're gonna sand further than we're gonna to need to apply our paint, because we wanna put our paint down, put our clear down over the paint, but we don't wanna be putting our clear right up to the edge of where we've sanded. So sand further than you need. So using the tail end as our example, you can see on the top side here where I've taped off and I want a nice sharp edge. I can paint all the way to that masking tape and then I can clear coat all the way to the masking tape as well and then finally peel the tape off and final sand. The underside's a little bit different because I want my white paint to blend into the original white paint of the board. So I've sanded with 600 wet until the fin of the board I want my clear coat to stop about a sharker before the fin, so I want my white paint to stop about a sharker short of where my clear coat would end. So this is the clear coat going down here, so we want to make sure that all of our white paint that we've laid down is covered by clear, but we don't want to be going beyond where we've sanded onto original glossy paint. If you're putting paint on top of old paint that hasn't been sanded, that's where you're going to get peeling from and your paint job just won't last. So now we're wet sanding with 800 and the only thing we have to contend with is sanding our paint job smooth, getting rid of any orange peel, making it nice and flat and the only scratches that should be left on the board should be from our 600 wet sanding that we did before painting. So we can get rid of those 600 scratches with our 800, we can flatten out our paint with our 800 and then go on to polishing. 
So with only 800 scratches left, we can polish them out, and this is our final, final result. I really enjoy these jobs. If you can get your hands on these boards, they're really good for both learning epoxy repairs and also learning good finishing techniques when it comes to paint. If your repairs aren't good, once you put paint over them, it will definitely show you the flaws in your repairs. And to get a good, neat finish on these boards is, um, yeah, it's good practice for pretty much every step. Well, I'm going to bed because I feel like ass, but um, thanks for watching. Subscribe, do all that, and we'll see you in the next one. Chee-hoo!